Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I think I see more ladies here, and we get a lot of supporters here, which is great. And uh, we were just saying that this is the worst time for a discussion, because all of you will be very sleepy um, after lunch, you know. So I hope you all have a good lunch, and uh, thanks for staying put and listen to, to us. I have a great, great, great panel um, today over here. And um, um, I'm just wondering, is uh, uh, Ms. Gao Bak Ho, is she? Oh, she is. She's on. I can't see her. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. We wish you can, you can join us uh, online, uh, here today in person. But nevertheless, um, nice to meet you. So I have the a wonderful panel, all power lady, and we just talk about, just now we had a great discussion. We talk about a few of, two of them here has brought down the average age, which is great, you know, and it's a, there's a confirmation here. I'm the oldest among all, so they have to respect me and answer all my questions. <laughs> all right. So I will start from the, from my left, and uh, uh, I'm Amna Shari, right? Amna will do her own uh, self-introduction la later on. I'm Roger Tay on my left. And on my right here, I've got Valerie and uh, Elise, Elsa, Elsa Tamarine, yeah? So welcome and uh, thank you so much. We had a really good discussion just now, half an hour ago, and we just wish it was pre-recorded or the session should be here instead of us you know, discussing on the same topic again. So I am Helena Pua. I flew in for this event from Hong Kong. I'm Malaysian, based in Hong Kong. I've lived there 36 years, still very much a Malaysian. And I flew in for this event because it's extremely important. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still, but Malaysia is still at my heart. I'm the exco member for the Malaysian Chamber of uh, Commerce in, Mal in Hong Kong, where we support uh, Malaysian businesses and students, Malaysian students living in, uh, in Hong Kong. Right. So without uh, uh, further delay, you know, into this really, really big topic on women business leadership, survival and recovery, I'd like to start and call upon our panelists to give a quick seven minutes uh, intro about themselves, you know, about, you know, uh, mac uh, macroly about what they do in the company, how do they face with these challenges, you know, or, or maybe opportunities because of the, of COVID. And uh, without further de delay, maybe I could start with you, right? Yeah, Amna. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Helena. Uh, apa kabar? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon. I reckon everybody is a bit uh, tired after lunch. But anyway, my name is Amna. I'm 57 years old, so I cannot beat somebody. <laughs> anyway, uh, still, I'm always an entrepreneur. I worked for Sabondi for a very brief time, just about two years. Uh, but then, always been an entrepreneur. I have many companies. And the recent one, my passion is into technology where I do tracking of all the halal uh, processes and everything from the company to the certifier and everything. So you got the, the key data using the blockchain and so on and so forth. Yeah. So about me, uh, I come from a very humble beginning from the kampong. Uh, no, there's no water, there's no electricity. You do everything at the sungai, at the river. So anyway, it's a blessing in a way. So I today is about women, yeah? but alhamdulillah, I never feel that I'm... I have to differentiate myself whenever I go anywhere. So from education to sit on the board of many organizations, including the Chamber of Commerce or meeting ministers, I always feel that I have to challenge myself or just being myself. Uh, I think one of the things that I believe that we have to be uh, aware of, of other people's feeling uh, and also to be tolerant. Uh, when I got my scholarship from the government of Malaysia to go to the States, they wanted me to be a diplomat. So I have to study politics uh, in the States, in California, and I hate politics. And then I said, can I change my degree? They said, oh, tak boleh lah. Tapi if you really can take two degree, you boleh lah. You know, you sure you want to pay two for two degrees? I did. 
I have two degrees. So, and then I want to go to Peter Drucker Center, which is a business school. And again, I said, Tabole la, MBA, pure. You have to take international relation la, you know, because you are going to be a diplomat. So again, I said, Alamak susahnya. But I did. I went to Peter Drucker, and of course, I take a lot of his classes. And at the same time, uh, I, I have to graduate in international relations to go to in the diplomatic area. But in my life, I said I'm very happy because uh, since I was in 1992, since I was 28, I started a business to help foreign investors to set up businesses in Malaysia. And from there, I met the top CEOs, the top uh, owners of uh, businesses around the world. And uh, I speak good English then and a little bit now. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's about understanding the need of people. So for uh, I'm one of the first person in Malaysian International Chamber of Commerce uh, in 164 years as a woman. And suddenly all the men there, you know, the CEO of HSBC, Standard Chartered, everybody, uh, Pfizer. And how do you uh, converse with them and also... During that time, MIC, Malaysian International Chamber of Commerce, we lobby policies to the government. So you're talking to the ministers, you're talking to the PM, you're talking to the director general, and how you want to change the policies from the HR to immigration law to the trade law and so on and so forth. So I champion many, many things uh, from the uh, supply chain, you know, the wholesale market and so on and so forth, which we change many things. Uh, so I never consider, my, yes, I'm a woman, uh, I do play golf with the guys, I do tennis as well, I do squash, and oh, I do uh, uh, other things that the women like as well, you know, designing clothes and so on and so forth. Um, I do many charities. So in seven minutes, I think uh, I have another few more minutes. Uh, my passion is always that, and I always... Uh, and the, the last one that I set up is Serunai. Serunai is in the technology, and of course I always mentor many, many SMEs, men and women, and of course, uh, I hired 70, 80 percent women in my company since I was 28. So that is not new things. And I agree. Uh, maybe I forgot to tell you one of the reasons I want. One of the reasons why I want to set up my own company. I have menstrual, horrible menstrual all the time. And I work with a Japanese company very briefly. And of course, there's no such thing as as MC. And you have to stay back until even eight and nine. Uh, so I have to be the last person to leave the office. So what I'm trying to say is that um, I thought about myself, I said, hey, I set up my own company and I'll be independent of myself. And at the same time, I do what I like best. And I love talking and I love investment. So I told my government at the end of the day, hey, I'm also a diplomat. I bring the investors in. And uh, so I'm doing the job. And uh, when they, like Tesco and many more, when they hired many, many people uh, after that, and I feel proud because that's what, you know, you're creating economy uh, for the country. So in many ways, I am doing uh, a diplomat job. By the way, when I came back and I want to be a diplomat, you know what happened? Uh, in 1987, there's a world recession and they said, too bad, I'm not ada kerja, no job. So we release you. So that's where I went back to the States and worked there. And of course, then I gain experience. So I guess my seven minutes has uh, come up. So thank you so much for listening. Very, very impressive. <clears throat> it's all about your choice and followed by your passion. When you touch on the J Japanese culture and the work environment, I've been traveling to Japan for the last 20 years, you know, because we have a huge uh, um, uh, setup there. And I still remember, you know, for the many, many years when I started traveling there, nobody agreed to call me a miss. They still call me mister. So I keep looking at myself. Do I look like a man or I look like, oh, I am a woman. You know, I question myself. So anyway, joke aside, Rajate, would you like to share with us? Yeah. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, great to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, miss seeing people in the flesh. I am a career banker. I started out uh, in an investment bank. Well, actually, I started out doing audit, and then I saw the people down the road getting, you know, just driving better cars than we did. So I thought, okay, let me just give it a shot. I was uh, extremely naive, I think, at that time, not knowing that uh, it was that it was and still is a very male-dominated industry. Investment banking, in particular, it is still very much male-dominated. So those early days, um, I was only one of two ladies on our floor. I was in CIMB. And then the early days when we were dealing securities, there were no girls at all. And you still had to 
you know, um, deal and trade on the floor. So everybody was swearing very hard, smoking even harder. And then I thought that was the only one, only way to kind of, you know, get in it is to equally smoke and swear so that, you know, you'll be one of the guys. Fast forward, that's not so true at all. It, you know, I think for women to rise, you must retain your femininity and you must harness the, you, the, the maternal instincts that we have. I truly believe that, you know, we have that power of nurturing uh, and we provide diversity different uh, we provide something else, we bring different things to the table. So since then, I've, um, from investment banking, then um, I went on to do Islamic banking. So I packed my bags and went off to the Middle East because it was something new then and uh, not knowing what it was all about. A lot of people said, you know, that you're risking your, you know, your whole career by diving to something that people don't know where that was going to head. And then um, that took off because Malaysia was driving the whole Islamic banking thing. And then I came back and I helped uh, set up the world's first and is still the only one, an Islamic commodity trading platform on Bursa. And so my team and I, we had no idea how to do it uh, then. There was no manual. It was still a blank page of paper, but you know, you dive in together as a team. And today, uh, I run wholesale uh, in Ambang. Uh, I've, uh, before that, I was in Hong Leong. When I was in Hong Leong, I discovered that I needed to move towards digitization, something that I also don't know how to do then, and I had to go and learn about it, uh, and something that I drive until today. So in short, I just want to say about my journey was, um, I truly believe that adventure begins at the edge of your comfort zone and that you must always be brave and courageous to try things that you've never tried before. So when I, was, uh, when I went into investment banking, I actually studied law, so I did, and then I went to KPMG. I didn't even know debit from credit. Um, when I went into Islamic banking, I knew nothing of Islamic banking as well, uh, and then now driving the whole piece of digitization. So talking about the blockchains of the world and APIs, uh, a bit of, um, a bit of a promotion here. We are the only local bank in the country that uh, has exposed, uh, you know, our APIs for the use of third party. Um, there's so many things that we've done that we didn't know where to start, or what, I didn't know where to start. So really, the, the, the thing is, I, as 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 a as a woman leader, what I see is that a lot of women, and I hope you can make that change and drive change for other women as well. Is that do you realize if there's a job to be done and the guy may, may, may have 50% technical ability, but he will put up his hand and say, I can do the job. But the woman who probably has got 100% can do this, often would just shy away and not take on that challenge. So we must, we must be able to push our boundaries to comfort and take on risks. I know we're, we're designed differently and that we're probably designed to be a bit more risk averse, so that's the maternal uh, structure. Uh, but for you to go further, you have to be able to be brave enough to, to accept challenges and, and do things that you've never done before. So my entire 25 years, I mean in the short three minutes or so, essentially is about, let's just go for it. You know, never done it before, don't know, but it's an adventure. And life is one long, big adventure. So enjoy the ride. The other thing that I want to say is also was um, it's about building, it's about ha building the team behind you and with you because you can never, never go far without having people who believe in your journey. And as women, I think that's where we can make that, we can differentiate instead of saying that follow me. What we could do is that I want to go there and that's why I want to go there. And I think we can make changes you know, along the way. If you get people to believe in your cause, your journey will not be a lonely one. That I can promise you. And I'm extremely blessed to have people who've been with me over 20 years. So I'm a just a little bit younger than Amana. I'm, uh, I'm turning 55. So the fact that I've had people follow me 20 years from different banks to different markets. They flew with me to Bahrain, to Kuwait, to Australia. We've moved to Singapore and we didn't know where we were going to land. But as long as they trust you and you trust them, and loyalty goes both ways, and you know, 
So just a little bit of piece of uh, sharing here. Thank you. Rajat say you are extremely humble. You know, I read that, you know, you can't tell between a credit and a debit. And now you're the award. Then you won um, an award, you know, award-winning banker. This is amazing. <laughs> Very humble. Like you say, women are extremely humble. I have to say, you know, <laughs> right. Okay. So onto my right, the lady in pink. I think the youngest one here. She's the one who brought the average rate down, uh, age down among our group here. Valerie, please share with us. Hi everyone, um, my name is Valerie Ong. Um, I'm not sure why we're even talking about age because none of these beautiful ladies look their age at all. So I'm actually going to ask them for advice. Uh, what supplements do you guys take, you know? Um, yeah, so that's something I need to work on. Um, anyway, uh, I'm the group CEO of KIP Group, uh, which comprises of property development, retail management, as well as hospitality. I am also the chapter chair of YPO, uh, which stands for Young President Organization. Um, since uh, both ladies have already shared um, all the vast experiences that they've had uh, for their past couple of years, um, I'm, not, I'm gonna share something different uh, in my piece. Um, so today, I want to share some factual information or data to give you a bit of perspective um, in the female leadership. I mean, on female leadership in the YPO uh, uh, YPO world. YPO essentially is uh, it's a platform where all the CEO around the world uh, uh, gather together to have a sh to have shared experiences, um, be it family, uh, businesses, or uh, personal. We have a total of 32,000 CEOs around the world, um, covering more than 450 chapters and across 130 countries. And we have co a combined revenue of USD 9 trillion. If I remember correctly, uh, if, the mem my, if my memory serves me right, we are the third, if not the fourth largest uh, economy drive, uh, the driver uh, around the world. I would say this is a relatively huge sample size. Um, why I'm sharing this is because 11% of these 32,000 CEOs are female repre uh, representative in uh, as, as a female CEO. Regionally, we are standing at about 22%, and in Malaysia, we are standing at 18%, which is a great number. Um, why these numbers are significant? Uh, because there, there's two counts. Um, first, we have a relatively uh, 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 a decent growth in women leadership, especially in, in Malaysia as a uh, landscape where SC of the Security Commission is promoting um, uh, for all. I mean, as in uh, encouraging all the listed company to have 30% uh, uh, female co uh, uh, directors uh, composition. And I believe that the role of a uh, woman uh, business leader will help to transform the, the corporate boardrooms and decision as pressure on uh, uh, diversity, and, diversity and inclusion growth. Second, given the low uh, entry to entrepreneurship, anyone can take on the challenge to start a business and it is no longer gender specific. And this is an opportunity to all women here and everybody. Um, Maybe I want to touch on a little bit because we did say that, you know, maybe uh, uh, Helena did ask uh, what are some of the challenges or keep something that keep you awake. I, I don't really think about challenges that way. Um, I just, you know, if there's any uh, new challenge or task that is uh, posted my way, I just do it. I don't think so much about it. Um, but I would like to maybe share a little bit about um, this uh, Cheryl uh, Sandsburg uh, lean-in concept. I truly believe in it um, and I think some of the women this morning also shared that you know to you need to want it you know you, you, if you don't want it right no matter how much em empowerment, empowerment that you are given it's just a word you know you are you are here to empower people and you are also being empowered by people as well so you will need to want it we need to take um, career risk um, as, especially when uh, generally women tend to shy away from any stretch assignments or any uh, challenges because we are just unfamiliar with. Um, so we basically we need to shift from um, I'm not ready to do it to I'll learn by doing it. Uh, let me give you a very uh, uh, a real scenario. I'm actually just recently married 
And uh, naturally, I am heading towards uh, wanting to build a family. And this is really horrifying, if not terrifying, um, because you know I've been running the business for the last more than 10 years. And uh, obviously, don't think so much about you know family and that kind of thing. And, I mean, I'm 34, okay? Uh, now, all of you know my age. Uh, hopefully, I will look as good as them next time. Um, so, the thought of uh, building a family of my own or being pregnant uh, while working, this is very terrifying as, my, as, 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 I mean, I, as I'm talking right now. Um, but, you know, it is something that everybody has been through. That's something that I would deal with it and, um, and, and, and I would deal with it. So um, another thing, another piece um, is basically uh, the lean-in circle. Um, this is something that I have uh, the opportunity to uh, experience in the YPO uh, platform. Um, basically, uh, it is a, we have a forum where uh, all our members meet up and basically discuss about anything and everything that you can't discuss with your spouses and your, your, your colleagues. And basically, this is, my source, this is where I source my energy. And I feel that everybody here, if you are, giving the, if you are given the, the empowerment, you are, you are ready to empower people, but sometimes you're just feeling a little bit low, you need to find the place to source for your energy, and uh, for me, it's in YPO. Um, certainly, the uh, pandemic has less, left a dent in my business portfolio, and as cliche as it may sound, uh, we learn to per, uh, persevere, and we learn to overcome, and we learn to move on. Um, Sometimes, it is okay to, be, to show your vulnerability, and this is something that actually, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a taboo in many cultures, and it is a taboo in, in in many, uh, in the in the corporate world, but I don't believe in it. And I think being vulnerable, you are able to grow yourself, but further. This time, everybody needed help. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, everybody needed help, right? It was a reset, and it's a reset for everybody. And there is no better time to ask for help than uh, now. So, irregardless of your gender, age, um, we start again, and we must start now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Valerie, with this YPO, is that the same as uh, like in Las Vegas? What is in Vegas stays with Vegas. You're not allowed to share. <laughs> yeah, you can basically in the forum, you can uh, share in full confidentiality and you're not supposed to share with anyone. Um, but the idea basically is to uh, share your experience. Um, you, you don't actually give any advisors. Um, everybody will share their piece and be, hopefully you will have... Uh, uh, a nugget of uh, um, uh, how do you guess, uh, from their sharing right, yeah, right, uh, as right. a take home line, I in fact I actually I have a lot of um, just now you know talking to Alicia and with Valerie a lot of respect for two of them managing the family business because I can fire my boss but they can't fire the father you know or the parents <laughs> okay so I guess maybe we can bring that into the discussion later Right, and, uh, we can talk about it. So, Alicia, can you share with us? Yeah. Yes, hi, everybody. Uh, hello, my name is Alisa Tamrin. I'm actually from Palembang, Indonesia. Anybody doesn't know Palembang, that's like the city of Pempek, the fish cake. I think that's very popular for the um, food cuisines. So, basically, uh, myself, pretty much like Valerie, I'm in the family business, been in the business for 22 years. At first, like our business, I think this year has been like 54 years for the milestone. And then um, we're starting from the automotive sectors. My dad started from the automotive. Um, so we are pretty much like from the two wheels, um, motorcycles and cars. And after I'm coming and joining in, we're diversified into the retail, shopping centers and banking. So pretty much, I think the journey like for the 22 years is quite interesting, yeah. And uh, I, can, I can also feel the same thing like whatever the women leaders right now feeling, especially with the family business. Like Rajata said, um, it's quite, my business is quite male dominant. Pretty, uh, pretty much all my principles um, from the product and brand that I have is all Japanese brands. So it's pretty much like very, very male dominated. So if we have to go into the meetings and everything, you're supposed to be just like sitting down and you just listened. 
and um, go back fast forward like at the first beginning if I'm talking to my, my, my boss who's my dad just like you just do what I say you don't say you just do what I say whatever that you do I can bypass you and then I can cut you just like that so I think that's kind of like quite interesting um, you know um, journey that I have to go through as like uh, a woman itself uh, being like have to be submissive and male dominant so it's very interesting and that is the boss and I think it's interesting because it's usually they will always say oh you're in the small city in the small city you have everything you're already rich um, so you don't have to work you just sit down pretty and then you don't have to work they don't know there's like really blood sweat and tears because most of the, most of the time we uh, Helena said, we cannot fire the boss, but the boss can fire us all the time. He, he can say like, okay, um, you're not being like a filial daughters. Right now, you're being fired. He, 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 he will say that all the time. It's like, not one time, two times, three times, but so many times. I always got kicked out from the house. It's like, okay, you get away from the house. So I think that's kind of like the experience that, you know, being a daughter and then being working in a family business means. Um, and then I'm kind of like thinking because um, there's so many things that we have to learn as like a female too that sometimes in the government place when you talk with them they can say something like you're not supposed to talk like that you have to talk nicely you have to talk with smiling and you have to talk politely you're not talking like that it's not supposed to be with women talk and I'm like, really? I don't have to talk like that? Yeah, because that's not the way women talk. So sometimes like in the, in the I think like 10 years ago, my kind of like learning as a woman in the, this kind of situations and business, I'm trying to figure it out. What it takes to be the women leaders, even though you have like a very high positions in your city and then with your positions, why it is very difficult to being a woman. Before I entered the organizations like YPO or EO, nobody telling me and teaching me, being women, you just have to be like, you know, just grab on, like being le uh, leaders in here. You just have to grab it, you have to take it. You have to be just like, you know, you d you're not competing with anybody else. So I think, I think like the boys, Looking at us, when we work hard, they will ask me, Lisa, why you work so hard? Nobody chasing you. I'm like, what's so wrong? Be uh, what's so wrong being like working hard? What's so wrong if I want to strive and then just want to do what I, I can do? That's so wrong. But I cannot explain it to them because they think that I'm crazy. So I'm like, I'm not chasing anybody. Yeah, but you work so hard. You don't have to work so hard. You have to slow down. Nobody chasing you or you're not competing with anybody. So I have to learn that I, I have to accept with the society, maybe like in Asia country, especially in my country, I have to accept and embrace, you know, uh, my shortcomings. And then I have to learn how to become and juggle between, be, be, between the leaders and become the woman and accept who I am. Um, when I'm married, I already have like four kids right now. I think it's very difficult that I have to teach my kids everything. I have to handle the house. I have to cook and I still have to work and I have to fly here and there. Always, always have like this sense of the guilt. But I think it's kind of like interesting right now because it kind of like opened me in a very new perspective. Like, hey, this is fine. This is okay. This kind of like shortcomings that I have Actually, it's work with everybody because I can also nurture them, nurture my people right now. And then it's kind of like really establish my com uh, our company. So from the time when um, I joined from 2000 and 2000, 2022 right now, I already changed my company into three folds for the profit, profit wise, even though the, the gross revenue is still the same thing. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'm really bringing something. Because when you in the automotive that I learned for the 22 years, all the principle just 
I always, our company is always like renewed every year. So is there's no certain things that I can always have like guaranteed that I have the products every year. You have to renew it every year. So the only thing that to survive for me is I have to diversify the business. And then right now, um, the portfolio is already 70-30, which is, I think, it's quite okay. And then I guess I learned that um, to make mistakes, um, it's, it is okay. And then for the challenge that I have right now, really, really about the people, yeah? How to understand the people. Because at the end of the day, everything has to be plus and minus. Everybody in each of us have the strong point and the weak point. And then really, I just have to juggle it. Like, what is your positions good for? And what is your strength and what your weakness? And how to create like um, a good teams in the company to make it successful and then strive in this kind of situation and business. I think that's pretty much about me. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think at the end of the day, women are so good in multitasking. You know, I guess if, if you ask a lot of successful women, where did they get this? Where do you get this from? They always say, I learned from my mother. How many people say, I learned from my father? <laughs> so I think most time, but most people, when you ask them, what did you learn from your, the business angle, the, the business equipment, they say, I learned from my dad, you know, so that is a, that's the distinction between the two. So, yeah, and then I would just like to pull our last uh, panelists on. And Ms. Uh, Gelbako, sorry to make you wait. And uh, we wish, we, like I say, we wish you to have you here. I know it's never that great or not on the screen, but it's great to have you with us. So kindly share with us, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Dear distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it is indeed a great uh, honor and pleasure for me to be presented here in this prestigious global event. It is pity I cannot join you physically in Kuala Lumpur, but thanks to the uh, technology, I have an exciting opportunity to enter the podium remotely and to participate alongside you. First, I would like to express my gratitude to the Dr. Jessia Tang, Chairman of the Organizing Committee of World Women Economic and Business Summit and Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific for organizing this event every year and for inviting Tajik Women Organization to be a part of it. I come from Tajikistan, the smallest country in Central Asia in terms of population, just over the 9 million in terms of uh, area. Tajikistan is a landlocked country located far from the key Eurasian transport routes bordering Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, China and Afghanistan. 93% of country is covered by mountains. Globally, it uh, ranks 135th in terms of GDP and 125th by Human Development Index. Uh, I would like to shed light on the situation of uh, how did women entrepreneurs survive during the uh, pandemic and post-pandemic period. Uh, to to answer your question through the prism of my uh, organization, namely the National Association of Business Women of Tajikistan, which unites more than 3,000 women micro entrepreneurs, farmers, and artisans. We have been working for more than 25 years on developing women's entrepreneurship and economic empowerment of women in Tajikistan. So, how did women entrepreneurs in small and micro businesses? that is our members survived during the uh, COVID and post-COVID pandemic in transitional economy like Tajikistan and an agricultural country with a predominantly patriarchal system. What helped? First, uh, through the please again, all our members, I can say that a demonstration of traditional female qualities such as inventiveness, communicability, adaptability, and ability to learn all time, such as mastering uh, the new digital skills. Women entrepreneurs each sold their own way to normality, demonstrating determination, 
perseverance, thinking over their experience and current events, proving and building their leadership qualities. Women entrepreneurs became uh, the leaders of innovations, reforms, continue to develop their businesses in these incredibly complex conditions. To recover uh, business volume, get at least some positive financial results, many had to rebuild their operation, management, speed up the implementation of digital solutions, hastily learn the benefit of the internet and so promoting and selling their goods and services. For the crisis was the availability and affordability and fast implementation of digital technology. All this became possible thanks to astonishing changes in the consumer segment. In just a year to 18 months, we experienced a radical change in how we communicate with the family, perform our work, travel, get the medical care, spend free time and many other daily experiences. This change speed up the uh, transition to digital technology at the great scale and immense speed in all sectors of economy. Remote working and digital access to services rolled in like an avalanche everywhere. Uh, it is especially gratifying to see that small and medium-sized businesses stay at the front of implementing innovative digital solutions. Consumer behavior and demand models have changed greatly and apparently will continue to change and women are more sensitive in capturing uh, consumer preferences, analyzing demand signals in real time and adapting quickly to restore supply chains and drive their companies towards successful recovery. Since women are very common in trade, retail, development of e-commerce is also their great merit. And finally, the third factor that had positive effect on the micro business survival rates is um, expanding access to finance. Uh, that is uh, improved financial inclusion in general particular breaching the gender gap and financial inclusion. For example, even so nearly 1 billion women still remain beyond reach of formal financial institution. In the last two years, gender gap and financial inclusion was reduced to 6% worldwide and to, six, to 9% in uh, the Republic of Tajikistan. Being financially included means individuals and enterprises have been access to the entire range of uh, affordable financial products and services they did, such as payments, post-pandemic outlook, there are still, uh, this is uh, the ongoing impact of COVID, the knock-on effect of the Ukraine conflict changes to supply chains as a result of the sanctions. Uh, the on and off conflict on the border, the movement of people cross-border trading and overall supply chains and growing tensions and risk at the border with Afghanistan. Women in Tajikistan and I think in other parts of the world in small and micro businesses are moving from one to another at the moment. Summing up, I can say the digital transformation of themselves, bridging gap in access to finance played a positive role in overcoming numerous crises. We must support the recovery process through the combined efforts of the government, financial and monetary policy, and the action by uh, business associations and civil society institutions. Uh, this will allow MSMEs to survive, get back their financial performance and maintain um, a strong growth and development. And through the context of Tajikistan, I can say that the implementation of national wide policies aimed at enabling the economy's digital transformation 
will provide a strong foundation, can provide a strong foundation for dynamic, sustainable, and inclusive recovery. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. So I, I know we are squeezed with time. I think I'm just going to take a quick dive into the few questions I have in mind, and I'd like to open to the floor for you to ask any questions to the panelists. We have a great set of panelists here today. So what do you see as the biggest change or adaptation this pandemic has brought about the way you manage your business and people? Do you think this change is indeed necessary? As leader in your organization post-COVID, what is your transformational strategy? What it takes to lead the renewal phase? Reinvent is a big word. How do you build sustainable changes into business and operating uh, models? So I'd like to pose this question. Who would like to take this, this question first? Valerie. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm actually taking on the transformational um, question. Um, during the pandemic, um, obviously in the retail, all three sectors of mine uh, were affected by the pandemic. Um, just to give you a brief, we're in property development, retail management, as well as, well as hospitality. Um, I'm going to take the retail management um, um, sharing. Uh, I'm going to share with you basically. Um, a lot of people are asking us to digitize our business, but you know, digital is our biggest enemy in the retail space because we are running a shopping mall. We want people to come to our mall instead of uh, shying them away from um, our mall. So we did explore about it because everyone was basically jumping into uh, digital, dig digitizing their business at, uh, during the first couple of months um, during the pandemic and we realized that it just doesn't work. Um, there are certain, I mean obviously Shopee, I'm sure all of you do, uh, do your shopping in Shopee as well as Lazada, but there are certain experiential um, experience that just cannot be um, fulfilled through uh, this digital space. So um, instead of transforming the business as a whole, um, oh sorry, so basically we are a community-centric neighborhood malls. Um, so basically all our re uh, SME uh, traders as well as the service providers, they are mainly um, uh, uh, selling daily necessities. So basically these are the things that you need to go to the malls and to go to, to the shopping malls to, to experience or to buy. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I'm sure all of you also have experienced um, I mean, you try to make everything convenient. You buy your uh, groceries online. Um, I don't want to name names, but there are so many supermarkets which are on Happy Fresh. Um, every single items you buy, right? Um, you're trying to convenient yourself by not needing to go to the mall. That, but at the end of the day, we are we are uh, uh, sent with so many messages saying that you know there's no tomato, there's no uh, cabbage. Uh, so do you want to replace the cabbage with? something else and that kind of thing. And then it makes it so inconvenient for us. We might as well just go to the supermarket, spend half an hour, get everything and we get out. Or, or even, you know, at least um, uh, do your other shoppings as well. So, it, so in my business, instead of uh, transforming it into the digital space, I have... Uh, uh, sort of relook at uh, human behaviors because at the end of the day we are quite uh, forgiving as humans we are we are forgiving we are also quite forgetful um, we you know most of you here are already not wearing masks right we have forgotten what social distancing is already um, but of course we are also being cautious but having said that you know um, we need to understand what are our uh, human instinct or, or human behavior. So then we can actually find the right uh, tenemics that, that sort of uh, cover, uh, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, to, to take care of our, our social needs. Lah. So on that note, um, I have uh, re-strategized with my team um, and basically we look at uh, the tenemics and what are the things. Okay, these are certain I, want, I would like to share with you that, you know, for women, uh, because we are caregivers, we are also very understanding people. Uh, we, we understand the men, we understand what women wants, we understand what children wants. 
but men doesn't know what woman wants, right? So, so this is the space that we can actually cover very well, uh, especially in the retail space, right? So we need to know what the men will do when the woman is doing the shopping and uh, what are the things that the children will do while the father is busy looking at technology stuff. So what, what are the areas that we can cover better uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? So basically, uh, on that note, we are, we are quite, uh, we're in a good space. Um, and certain things don't need to change. Certain things need to change, we change. Um, so that's my piece. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, jumping into my two second question very quickly is as we recover from this crisis, do we want to be different? And if so, how? So investing in people, investing in technology, right? How do you strike the balance of this huge investment and at the same time, maintain a healthy balance sheet. So, Rajate, can I go to you for this uh, for answer? Well, the banks are amongst the biggest users of technology. The investment in technology in the financial industry has been far bigger than any other industry, I would say. Having said that, despite that, we are also heavily disrupted. The most, one of the most disrupted industry is also the financial industry. And because of that, the banks are feeling that we have to do more. We have to embrace more technology. We have to do, we have to embrace digital technology even more so than what we've already been doing all these years. So the striking of the balance, in my view, is not so much the employment of technology, is how we can actually shift the paradigm of thinking in our people. I run a business with what I call a multi-generational workforce. I have baby boomers sitting at the top, I have Gen Xs at the C-suites, I have, uh, and then I have the Gen Ys, the Millennials, and I have the Gen Zs. In managing a multi-generational workforce, the, the balance that you're talking about is actually being able to get everybody on the same page. Because it's not about want of technology, you can buy the technology, but whether or not the guy on top is comfortable with moving towards new technology because he's probably ancient and don't understand, he or she. Or the young guy who said, I just want to go fast, quick, instant gratification and maybe without the experience of risks man risk management. So that's where we have to, when you talk about balancing it, I always feel right now what, uh, well, at least what we're trying to do is we're talking about, a, again, laying out the journey that we need to take. It, it is not going to be helpful if you get overzealous and tell everybody, look, we have to employ technology, move to digital, move at 100 miles an hour, because there will be that guy there who has been doing this job for 30 years. He may not be keen on digitization for one reason. Number one, maybe he or she doesn't understand the whole technology piece, so it's frightening to them. Number two, the fear of losing their jobs. What are you saying? Are you gonna automate everything that you no longer need me? People keep asking me, when are you guys gonna shut your branches down? We have 9,800 staff. You can't just say, let's just quit this and do everything online. It is still a community center, it is still a point do we shut down our branches or do we use our branches for something else? Do we, do we use it differently? So the key thing here in balancing that is telling them, and this is key I tell everybody, if you don't embrace digital technology, it is not whether or not we should do it or whether or not if we don't do it, we'll be less efficient. The point of not embracing digital technology will mean that we will no longer be relevant you will not even have a job 10 years from now. Your very existence will come under pressure in the financial industry if you don't embrace digital technology. So if you today, you're running a branch and you're doing something very manual, and I want to introduce automation, I want to introduce digital technology, technology do not be afraid. And you have to tell your people, do not be afraid. I am not replacing you. You're not being displaced. But what we have to do with these, um, with that workforce, is to teach them to do new things. Everyone in this room needs to relearn, and sometimes to learn something new, we have to unlearn. So that is very difficult. 
So the, the, that journey about balancing is who do we invest in new? Who do we invest to help them relearn? And who at the end of the day, I have, I have to say this, right, mate? I mean, if I'm going to, if I'm going to head into that direction, but if you're going to be pulling me back, maybe this is not, is not the place for you to be anymore. But we don't want to have huge number of casualties. We must always remember that the industries, the businesses, the companies that we built are built at the back of all these people that have been with us all these years. Just because now people can fly to the moon, you don't go and tell that guy there, I don't need you anymore. So the key here is laying out your entire, your plan, your journey. And the one thing you have to do is to convince everybody that they still have a place in this new face of this institution, this new face of organization. I mean, like what Valerie was saying, right? It is both online and offline. Some experiences you really want to step into the restaurant and eat. But that doesn't mean grab no longer just because MCO is lifted that there'll be less grab delivery. It's not like that. Different experiences you want, you know, you want to take out, you can still call grab. You want to have some really nice, you, you know, dining experience, you go in. It's the same thing with all of our businesses. Touch points, human touch points still matter. But we need to use technology to improve efficiency. And that's where we need to tell our people that is the balancing factor. Don't come and say, we need to change today. We're going to go 100% technology. And that will put fear in your workforce. And you will not get people to believe in your digital transformation. But trust me, every industry, doesn't matter what you do, digital transformation is crucial. Whether or not you have, you will continue to have a physical, uh, you know, face-to-face -face touch point with your clients. You still need to embrace technology in your processes in one way or another. Thank you. Great. Well said. I have a question for you. When you talk about, you know, not putting fear on the you know, digital transformation, people losing their job, what do you think of the... What do you say about the great res resonation that is happening everywhere in the world? You know, I know I, maybe there's so much, not so much in Malaysia, but definitely in the US, in Europe, uh, in Hong Kong to a certain extent, post-pandemic. Well, I tell you what's really going on. It's happening even in my industry. Is because soon after the lockdowns were, you know, lifted, everybody expected their staff to come into work. I don't understand that. I don't see why suddenly there everyone's hung up about, look, I have to see you to see whether or not you'll be able to work. So the great resonation that you're seeing in the West is largely within this industry, specifically the banking industry. Suddenly they want all these guys to turn up at work, right? Whereas some of them feel, I mean, I feel I can do eight to 10 meetings in a day because I don't have to get up from my seat and get into the car and go from here to Putrajaya and back to Klang or wherever it is. So efficiency, there must be a bit ability of the seniors and the superiors to understand that gone are the days where you need your guys to clock in. And gone are the days where you need to be able to see them to believe that they are actually effective. So these are the problem with, I have to say, the generation X, baby boomers. It was the same thing for me. I had board members breathing down my neck and say, why are your guys still not in the office? I said, why do I need them to be in the office? The whole FY20 and 21, did we lose money? We were working from home. And we were still making money over year on year. There has been constant growth. They were not in the office. So it is really at management and management level because you, we don't. And, and you see what happened over during the pandemic. We, we understand flexibility, the ability to also when you have to take care of your kid, you have to take care of your elderly parents and then also work. If you're required to do eight to five in there, it's really difficult, right? So that is why a lot of people say, I'm done. So we're trying to balance that out as well now. And I know you're doing the same, right? Like flexible. It doesn't matter. But if you have a child to attend to, then attend to the child. And then put the child to sleep and get back to your desk and work. I mean, in the banking industry, we're not all rig workers, you know. We're just desk guys. So you could do your stuff from, uh, in the desk. So 
I think that's why you're seeing that mass resignation is the inability to then adapt with the change post-pandemic. I mean, I, I think it's good. I mean, we can use technology to, to track productivity. So why do you need to see the person's face at 8.30 in the morning, right? So investing in people, investing in technology, how do you strike the balance? Um, Alicia, can, can you share with us? You know, as um, running the family business, how do, that, how do you balance that and your dad breathing through your neck and say, I need to see more profit? <laughs> Basic, basically, for my case, I really, really, uh, I really agree with the Raja. How actually you you really do laying the platform. For us, uh, we start investing in technology on 2016 for the ERP, and we're starting like also investing in our people, and then we built like the training center for our people on 2014 actually, because I think in Palembang. We are the first company that who's doing the training center that educate their people because we are in the hospitality industry, right? If we don't have like people, if we don't teach our people what kind of uh, what kind of like people that we have, what kind of quality that we have, because pretty much like all the undergraduates they don't really understand what's going on in the market. So you really have to train them and educate them. And for the ERP, when we start on 2016 before, uh, my dad never talked about the profit. When he invests, he just say, this is my instinct. Just build it. I'm sure it's making money. I'm like, how do you know it's making money? Yeah, it's my instinct. I've been experienced like 50 years. You just do it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Like our system before in the family business, I have to wait. 40 days just to do the profitability. It's not even like a close book yet. I cannot know what is the revenue, what is the profit until 40 days onwards. And I'm like so stressed out. I'm like, can, can we get the profit now? They said, no, cannot. You have to wait 40 days. I'm like, this is crazy. This is, doesn't make sense. So at the first thing is when we start implementing for the ERP, the only thing that I have to say to them is like, oh, don't worry. This technology bring a lot of peace into you. So you get the work easier. Everything's gone, uh, will do faster and everything. I'm not going to tell them this is going to be pain in the ass. This is going to be difficult. Because if I say this is going to be difficult, nobody want to do it. <laughs> nobody want to do it because this is going to be a failed project. So when the first thing is that we, when we want to start doing the ERP, we, have, we engage with the PWC too to engage uh, what kind of system that we want to be. We map. Uh, we do the whole things about uh, restructure our policy, the business process, and the flow. And it actually takes us three years to be able to develop the ERP. And after that, 2019, when it's ready, the COVID, the COVID hits. And it's very expensive, right, for the ERP. And suddenly... Um, for the human resource, on the COVID situation, looking at my business, that's like automotive, shopping center, hotel, business industry, uh, banking, everything got hit. I want to cry already on 2020. I'm like, I'm doomed. This is going to be so red. So discussing with my friend, how actually we're going to go out from this with, with the situations. For sure, this is like all closed business. And everybody's saying like, oh, it's okay. It's only one year. It's like, no way. This is only one year. This is going to be like more than three years. But luckily, because we already had having like training our um, human resource, our people training, and then the ERP. For the first three months in our business, from March to June, our, our sales from the automotive down to 80%. 80%. I'm like, okay, girl. okay, guys, this year we, have, we, we do not have profits. It's okay not being profitable. I just want to survive this end of the year. And then um, for the people, before we have 3,000 people, and then before after June, we have to make like a lot of job enrichment. So we have to try to say to them, okay, this is a very good opportunity to make you guys for your uh, to to use your uh, ability for everybody's skill 
um, to the fullest potential. So we cut the people, like uh, we restructure the, uh, our organizations to 1,700, so around 41%. Luckily, at the end of the year, the business actually, our profit only down um, 31%. So we are still profitable compared to the 2019. On 2021, because the ERP that we're having and for the human resource that we are being optimized, basically we rebound the people again. So the people number from 1,500 going back to 2,200 and the revenue that we grow from 2019 go back to 50%, but the profit that we have actually doubled to 75%. And then in 2022, our workforce is back. So we grow our business 46%, but the profit compared 2019 and 2022, we grow 175%. So I'm thinking like, oh, this is something that we must doing right, yeah? <laughs> so honestly, if we don't start um, doing the teaching again, like the human resource on 2014, and the ERP in 2016, honestly, I don't know how to survive on the post-COVID and after COVID. So that's pretty much. But really, it really one of the things is investing for the people and then investing for the system. It really saves you because before we don't have any exposure at all, and then we don't have anything like you know, real time. What kind of things that we need to um, analyze? But right now, everything is kind of like clear, so we know where's the directions um, that we want to go. Pretty much like that. Yeah, I think you're so right. You know, that kind of investment, especially for big companies like yours, you know, is, uh, is essential. You know, it's so necessary. All right, yeah. So jumping to my last question before I open to the floor is uh, on ESG. I think this is a big topic. Everyone is talking about ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So what is your approach to responsible business as a leader? So I would like to uh, put this question to Amna. All right, could you share lights with us? Yeah. Thank you. Um, in business, uh, we always have to pivot whenever things need to be done differently. You know, MCO has given us the opportunity, I think, the world to change. And every day as an entrepreneur and an individual person, as things get, pro I like problem solving actually. So ESG is one of the things that I love. And the project that I'm doing now is a full traceability of food, uh, especially halal processes. Uh, people like QSR that own KFC and Pizza Hut has 2,000 ingredients from 150 countries uh, just for halal. And your garam, that means your salt, your flour, all must be halal real time. Because halal is not forever. It's six months, one year, two years, or three years, depending on the product. So uh, I'm, um, I'm just giving an example of what I'm doing now. I'm doing the Indonesia and all OIC countries, where we trace from the company to, uh, companies to the center that process the application, to the auditors, to the government, to the ministries that are involved in the processes, including custom. So... Uh, this will give the, you know, the feel-good factor for the human being down there when they want to know whether the, uh, the, uh, you know, the community, if they want to know whether the product is really halal or not, they know that it's really halal. Uh, in the world, there's more than 400 logo uh, you know, that you can carry. But in Indonesia, by next two years, everything must be halal and you must carry only Indonesian logo. So everything that comes to Indonesia must be Indonesian logo. Uh, Malaysia... Uh, allow other logo, like 84 logo, to come in. So again, this is the problem. How do you want to trace? And during MCO and before MCO, the fake halal has become a big thing, you know, where they just put halal, actually it's not. So, and many more. It goes to vegan, it goes to organic, and many more, even kosher. All right, so my job is to please the community, the government, uh, the, you know, the centers that process the application and to make things uh, properly. Yes, technology is critical, but without human, technology is nothing. So you need technology because to ease your work. I, I used to have four, five hundred thousand a server 12 years ago. Today, everything is on cloud. I don't need my server anymore. So what I'm saying is that uh, you have to follow the trend, but 
not everything needs technology. I believe technology is supposed to solve matters and not we really become, you know, no matter what, there must be technology. I think that's, that's a bit odd for you if you consider that way. So for me now, uh, for Indonesia, for example, halal used to be about 90 days to 120 days, and they want it to be 21 days. So that requires uh, massive processes, and everything must be simplified from the company to the, the center to the government and all the auditors and so on and so forth. So that's why you need technology, just like our friend here, Elsa, Elsa, sorry. Uh, you know, but, but Balam, it doesn't need it because it doesn't need it, okay? So our friend uh, Raja Tay need it because it needs it. Today, if you don't have e-payment or debit card or, you know, grab pay or e-wallet or whatever it is, you're just like strange. Lah. Even some, most uh, restaurants don't accept anymore cash because they then, then can avoid fraud because people just are churi, lah, you know, even in 7-Eleven and all, Mr. Baya, uh, you know, through the system. So then you avoid the people that can rob them unnecessarily. So technology is needed, you know, even as we get older, as you know, um, you know, people, maybe I will be using robotic, you know, rather than having a crutch, you know, so in the future I have a suit you know, that maybe just working on that. So anyway, time is up. But yeah, uh, so yes, ESG is important and I'm very happy to be and proud that I'm part of the program. Thanks. Thank you so much. I know we are racing with time. In fact, I have questions for Gal Bakho. You know, I mean, I feel really bad. She's sitting in um, Tajikistan. And uh, can I just ask her one more question? Just last question. All right. So just a quick question for you. Sorry that, you know, that we, we can't overrun on the, on the timing. So I have one last question for you. Is how developed is women's entrepreneur, entrepreneurship in Tajikistan? Can you share with us? Yes, <clears throat> uh, actually the private sector is a major contributor to the Tajik economy, provide up to 30% GDP and about 35% employment. Uh, as uh, January 2011, uh, 2022, uh, 2022, Tajikistan has approximately 350,000 registered businesses uh, most of them run businesses on the individual patent base, uh, 41%, as a farmers, 49%, and only 9.5 registered as a legal entities. And women represent a small part of the registered businesses, only 23%. And uh, the larger the business, the smaller the chance, chance of being run by a woman. Only 11% of all legal entities are women lead. Um, commercial enterprises run by women are generally smaller and concentrated in the non production and service oriented sectors, which is, do not require many workers and investors. Some women also work in the high risk sectors, such as, uh, as a shuttle trade and, and trading in. The, Open market. Many women operate in the informal uh, and semi formal status for you. Only 2.5% yeah. of able bodied women are not enough. We need to continue uh, land, finance, access to information, and education and networking. And women need to be stimulated to learn uh, STEM uh, professions and enter promising high revenue sectors such as IT and technology, reduce the social barriers, eliminate gender violence in society and popularize the positive image of women entrepreneurs in public opinion. This is the strategy of our institution. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm such a bad moderator. I didn't give enough time for you to ask questions. But can the panelists, can you stay for another 15 minutes or so? If there's any question, please don't hesitate. We'll be here to answer. My apologies. Anyway, on this um, final note, thank you so much for your time. You know, such valuable sharing. I've learned so much to bring back to Hong Kong as well. So thank you. We'll all be here for another 15 minutes if you have questions. All right, thank you for your time, and uh, thank you all. Right, it's a pleasure. Thank you. A round of applause, please, for Miss Halina Poa and the amazing panelists, ladies and gentlemen.